Good morning everybody and welcome to our Saturday morning fun session. Yeah that's right like none of us have anything to do on the weekend except come in and chit chat, well. Come on Vincent, we know how studious you are. You'll probably spend the rest of the weekend in your library. You know, Karen, gathering information makes us more informed and better able to understand our world. Of course, young Bernard. I'm all in favor of sharpening the saw so to speak, and I'm just teasing, as usual. World of course, Karen. It's in your Republican nature by the way, How's the cat being going? Haha, oh, ha. cat ownership is the sign of a loving, caring, balanced life. Of course it is Karen. Let's take a good swig of our morning Tim Hortons double doubles, because we've got a few interesting items to digest this morning. Meow? Oh really? Then let's get started with the first item. The first item involves the most wonderful Christmas gift a man could receive, and it happened in Canada. Oh. Here we go with the Christmas homilies. It's not like we don't get enough Christmas on Woman's Channel. At last count, they've produced over 17,500 movies about Christmas. Weird, and that's just last week, I know. Well, women love them. Now, Vincent, tell us about this Christmas gift story. Well, a 67-year-old grandmother left her husband and hooked up her high school sweetheart from nearly 40 years before, and they got together and fell in love again. Then guess what happened? They live happily ever after. Well, they've been together for 13 years now and this Christmas the 66-year-old boyfriend received a brand new kidney. Oh, that's a Christmas great gift. That's hard to top. Well, you can't get a much more personal gift, and it was such a loving gesture, deserved a shout out. That's very heartwarming. It's nice to know that there are some good people out there. So I just got handed the report from our fat checking department. It looks like they've analyzed the Newsom DeSantis debate. You mean the one where Ron DeSantis wiped the floor with Gavin Newsom? Are you kidding, Karen? Don't tell me you're watching Fox News again. Oh, I keep it on Fox News 24 7. I'll bet you it confuses your cat. How's that? I'm sure when Sean Hannity comes on, it confuses them where their litter box is. What? Well, isn't he known as the great cat turd? No, young Bernard, you're thinking of that popular Twitter personality. Same thing. Well, let's dive right into the fact checking. In the last 10 years, we have had a 45% decline in homelessness. California's had a 45% increase in homelessness. This is correct based on data from the National Alliance to End Homelessness. The group's interactive website shows that Florida's homeless population has decreased by 46% between 2013 and 2022, while California's homeless population has increased by 45% in the same 10-year period. He signed a bill banning any exceptions for rape and incest, and then he said it didn't go far enough and decided to sign a six-week ban. So extreme is your ban that criminalizes women and criminalizes doctors that even Donald Trump said it was too extreme. A political action committee tied to Newsom aired TV ads in Florida ahead of the debate charging that a law signed by DeSantis would subject women to criminal charges if they received an abortion beyond the six-week ban in the law a claim the DeSantis campaign rejected as a lie. Democrats say the law has ambiguous language. Any person who willfully performs or actively participates in a termination of pregnancy in violation of the requirements of this section will be subject to a felony but DeSantis has repeatedly said the penalties in the law apply to healthcare providers not women seeking abortion care. 1,406 books have been banned just last year under Ron DeSantis' leadership. 1,406 books have been banned on your banning binge. Newsom is referring to a study by PEN America, an advocacy group that has an expansive definition of a book ban, including whether access to a book is restricted or diminished. The local Florida NBC station concluded that about 300 book titles were removed from shelves across the state's school districts in 2022, and there were wide disparities across the state. Of Florida's 67 counties, 21 of them removed books last year. Clay County in Northeast Florida had the most removals with 177, followed by Martin County in the Southeast with 98 removals, the report said. We have a 50-year low in the crime rate. This statement is based on incomplete data according to The Marshall Project, an online journalism organization that focuses on criminal justice issues. Seven of the top 10 murder rates in the United States of America are red states. This is a favorite statistic of the California governor, one we have explored before. He is relying on data from Third Way, a left-leaning policy group, which says it conducted the study to combat Republican claims about high crime in blue states. 
Newsom's use of the 2020 presidential electoral map to make his case leaves out important context. Many of the states on the top 10 list today have been on the list for decades regardless of whether they voted for the Republican candidate for president. We're near 50-year lows, down 55% violent crimes in the state of California from the 1990s. This is correct according to the Public Policy Institute of California. After reaching a 1992 peak of 1,115 per 100,000 residents, California's violent crime rate steadily fell, reaching a 50-year low of 391 in 2014. California's violent crime rate increased by 5.7% to 495 crimes per 100,000 residents in 2022. That is still 56% lower than the 1992 rate. He has one of the most regressive tax rates in the United States of America. It's the number three most regressive state in America. He taxes low-income workers more than we tax millionaires and billionaires in the state of California. Regressive means that lower-income people are taxed at higher rates than top-earning taxpayers. In the first part of this statement, Newsom is referring to a study by the left-leaning Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy. Florida has no state income tax, but the study which concluded that Florida ranks third among the most regressive states says that by relying on sales and excise taxes, Florida has among the highest taxes on low-income households. The effective tax rate on the bottom 20% of households in Florida is 12.7%, the study says. The top 1% in Florida pay 2.3% of their income in taxes compared to 12.4% in California, which the study lauds for its tax system. Comparison 12.7% effective tax on the poorest residents in Florida, compared to 12.4% on the wealthiest in California, appears to be the source of Newsom's claim that DeSantis taxes low-income workers more than we tax millionaires and billionaires in the state of California. There are various ways to look at death rates from the coronavirus, making it especially susceptible to spin. Hannity set the stage for the discussion by showing statistics from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Your state's death rates were also identical, he said 248.7 deaths per 100,000 in California and 252.8 for Florida. DeSantis readily agreed, while Newsom objected, this is factually untrue. Our colleague Philip Bump delves more deeply into this exchange, but these numbers are from the start of the pandemic and are adjusted for age. Florida has a much higher percentage of elderly people than California, so an age adjustment is appropriate. Newsom argued that DeSantis shifted course because of politics, and after being one of the first governors to shut down a state, reversed course and cast doubt on science. As a result, he argued, COVID deaths in Florida were higher after vaccines were introduced. That is reflected by CDC data. CDC statistics show that in 2020, age-adjusted death rates in California were 68.7 per 100,000 in 2020, compared to 56.4 for Florida. In 2021, after the introduction of the vaccines, California's death rate was 99.9 compared to 111.7 for Florida. In other words, the death rate more than doubled in Florida, even after adjusting for age in 2021, while it went up 45% in California in the same time period. Newsom charged that there was a 29% higher death rate in the state of Florida versus the state of California. He's referring to death rates adjusted by population. California with a population of 39,110,208 coronavirus deaths had a death rate of 282 per 100,000 people. Florida with 22.2 million people and 81,238 deaths had a death rate of 365 per 100,000. His staff also pointed to a Los Angeles Times article published this week. In raw terms, significantly more Floridians died on a per capita basis during the COVID-19 emergency than Californians, the article said. Of the four most populous states, California had the lowest cumulative COVID death rate. Well, I think we know who won the fact-checking contest. We should do this with every Fox News story. Truth in journalism would be a refreshing change. When we cut for lunch, how about a bowl of white clam chowder from Red Lobster? Red Lobster's irresistible all-you-can-eat shrimp promotion has indeed proved hard to resist. The ultimate endless shrimp deal has been so popular that it helped cause a drop in third-quarter profit for the restaurant chain which had to raise the price to $25 from $20. Thai Union Group, which owns a large stake in the chain, said in a third-quarter earnings call this month that the deal was in part to blame for an $11 million operating loss. 
Red Lobster hoped the promotion would bolster traffic at its US locations through fall and winter when its restaurants tend to be the emptiest. Ultimate Endless Shrimp had already been a Red Lobster guest favorite staple for over 18 years. But the restaurant took it a step further this summer offering the previously seasonal deal all day every day, instead of just on Mondays. Patrons could choose two shrimp dishes from a menu that includes shrimp alfredo served on a bed of linguine and a skewer of grilled shrimp over rice. Still, he credited the revamped offer for the increase in the number of guests, though he explained the company expected to see more of an upside. Too many, perhaps, heeded the advice listed in Red Lobster's own promotional material. Insider tip, avoid grabbing the extra biscuit to leave room for endless amounts of shrimp. My mouth is watering. Let's get through these stories. Okay, let's cover the antics of the man they call Orange Jesus. A federal judge on Friday rejected claims by former President Donald J. Trump that he enjoyed absolute immunity from criminal charges accusing him of seeking to reverse the 2020 election, slapping down his argument that the indictment should be tossed out because it was based on actions he took while he was in office. The ruling by the judge, Tanya S. Chutkin, was her first denying one of Mr. Trump's many motions to dismiss the election interference case, which is set to go to trial in federal district court in Washington in about three months. It offered a sweeping condemnation of what Judge Chutkin called Mr. Trump's attempts to usurp the reins of government, and cited foundational American texts like the Federalist Papers and George Washington's farewell address. Mr. Trump's lawyers had expected the immunity motion to fail. They have in fact been planning for weeks to use the defeat to begin a long-shot strategy to put off the impending trial. They intend to appeal Judge Chutkin's ruling all the way to the Supreme Court if they can, hoping that even if they lose, their challenges will eat up time and keep the case from going in front of a jury until after the 2024 election. Mr. Trump's lawyers first filed their immunity claims in October in a set of breathtaking court papers that maintained he could not be held accountable for any official actions he took as president, even after a grand jury had returned a four-count criminal indictment against him. While the Justice Department has long maintained a policy that sitting presidents cannot be charged, Mr. Trump's bid to claim complete immunity from criminal prosecution was a remarkable attempt to extend the protections afforded to the presidency in his favor. Just as brazen was the way in which his immunity motion sought to flip the script of the conspiracy case filed against him in August by Mr. Smith, the former president's lawyers essentially claimed that all the steps he took to subvert the election he lost to President Biden were not crimes, but rather examples of performing his presidential duties to ensure the integrity of a race that he believed had been stolen from him. Judge Chutkin had little patience for such arguments, saying on Friday evening that neither the Constitution nor American history supported the contention that a former president enjoyed total immunity from prosecution. She added, defendant's four-year service as commander-in-chief did not bestow on him the divine right of kings to evade the criminal accountability that governs his fellow citizens. Her decision to turn down Mr. Trump's claims of presidential immunity was arguably the most significant finding in her order. The Supreme Court has long held that the Constitution gives presidents immunity from civil lawsuits concerning actions taken as part of their official duties, although not from suits based on private, unofficial acts. But the decision by Judge Chutkin was the first time a federal court had ruled that a former president did not enjoy the protections of immunity from criminal prosecution. As part of her order, Judge Chutkin rejected claims by Mr. Trump's lawyers that by allowing the case to go to trial, it would the devil every future presidential administration and usher in a new era of political recrimination and division. His lawyers are likely to appeal the decision to a three-judge panel of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. If they lose before the panel, they may try again before the full court. Their appeals are likely to continue all the way to the Supreme Court. Whether the lawyers win or lose, they are hoping that their challenges eat up enough time to delay the trial until after Mr. Trump's potential return to the White House. If that were to happen, he could order his attorney general to simply dismiss the charges. Deny, delay, obfuscate. The game plan is clear, and if Trump doesn't make it to the White House, well, he'll probably end up in the big house. I need a vacation from all this. I think I'll buy a Cybertruck and go off-roading for the weekend. Speaking of which, Tesla's Cybertruck is making waves in the market. It's not your typical pickup aiming to be both a truck and a sports car. Elon Musk is confident about it. Indeed, Bernard. 
The Cybertruck has a starting price around $61,000, comparable to other electric pickups, but the lower-priced version won't be available until 2025. I'm not sold on it. Gas-powered pickups are more affordable and offer better towing capacity. The Cybertruck falls short there. True, Karen, but it's quick. The quickest version can go from 0 to 60 in just 2.6 seconds. And let's not forget the range. While it doesn't hit the promised 500 miles, it's still competitive among electric vehicles. I'll stick with my gas-powered pickup for now. The Cybertruck's futuristic design doesn't convince me. In the heart of the dense Sapien Puppetensis tribe's forest, where ancient wisdom meets modern curiosity, there resides a remarkable figure known as the Grand Sap. With a flowing white beard, gnarled wooden staff, and a robe woven from the leaves of centuries-old trees, the Grand Sap cuts an impressive and enigmatic figure. As the head of the tribe, the Grand Sap is revered not only for his age but for his deep understanding of the natural world and the mysterious forces that flow through it. To his tribe, he's not just a leader but a sage, capable of weaving spells and interpreting the ancient prophecies whispered by the wind through the forest canopy. On one unusually bright day, the Grand Sap emerged from the depths of the forest, riding a vehicle unlike anything his tribe had ever seen, a gleaming silver Cybertruck, an embodiment of modern technology amidst the ancient trees. With a faint chuckle and a sparkle in his wise, old eyes, he shared his thoughts, and so, Ah, my fellow Sapien Popodensis tribe members, behold this wondrous creation of the human world, the Cybertruck. A contraption of metal and electricity, a marvel from the realm beyond our forest. It is as if the ancients have crafted it with their own hands and infused it with the power of thunder and lightning. I have ventured into the realm of the Cybertruck, and it is a ride unlike any other. The sheer power it wields, the speed at which it moves through the winding paths of the concrete jungle, it is like harnessing the energy of a thousand thunderstorms. Though my roots are deeply intertwined with the earth, I must admit, this contraption intrigues me. While I shall always cherish the serenity of our forest, there is something about the Cybertruck that stirs the spirit of adventure within me. It reminds me that even in the ancient heart of our tribe, there is room for the modern world, and the two can coexist harmoniously. The Grand Sap, the wizard-like head of the Sapien Puppetensis tribe, left his tribe with a newfound curiosity for the modern world, embracing the Cybertruck as a symbol of the ever-evolving dance between nature and technology. Okay. The Grand Sap likes to live it up. I wonder if he needs a pillow to see over the dashboard? No, he uses self-driving mode, I'm sure. Does he take off his wizard hat when he drives? I doubt it. I hear he never takes off his hat, for anything. He must have a moonroof option. Ha ha. At least he doesn't need to recharge. Well, why not? It's a known fact that he has a Tesla coil in his hat. Makes sense to me. You've been watching Fox News lately? No, I saw an article in Popular Science who now just stopped publishing doesn't change the facts. Back to reality. Let's get the old man to weigh in on the Santos debacle. Well, back in my day, we expected our elected representatives to have some integrity. This Santos fella sounds like quite the troublemaker. Expelled from Congress without a criminal conviction? Now that's a rarity. Times sure have changed. Seems like politicians are more focused on party politics than doing what's right for the people. It's a shame. I remember a time when we respected the institutions of this country. Now it's all about personal agendas and revenge. I hope they can find a way to bring back some civility and decency to our politics. We sure could use it. Hey, did you guys catch the news about George Santos getting expelled? Yeah, quite a historic moment, isn't it? Well, it's about time they did something right. I mean, the whole party is facing a tough time now. Their majority is down to just three votes. Exactly. Governing is going to be a real challenge for them. They brought this upon themselves by protecting Santos for so long. This year has been nothing but chaos in Congress. First McCarthy's struggle for speakership, then his removal, and now this. And let's not forget those Republican mutinies on the floor. Embarrassing to say the least. The, the world is watching, and it's an international embarrassment. Santos symbolizes the chaos in the GOP. Lies, fraud, and controversy, it's all there. The Ethics Committee finally took action, and half of the Republicans voted for expulsion. He was dragging down the party's image, especially in New York. Expelling a member without a criminal conviction is unprecedented since the Civil War. But the evidence was clear. A bipartisan report sealed his fate. It's a new standard, and Santos was the example. With Santos gone, Johnson can't afford to lose more than three Republican votes. And there's another Republican leaving soon. They're in a tight spot. 
They're paying the price for their internal divisions. It's a tough call for Cole and others who had to vote against their party. But sometimes you have to put the institution first. They did what had to be done. Let's hope this doesn't lead to more retaliation and pettiness. Already our politics are embroiled in cycles of revenge. We need to focus on the country, not personal vendettas. Santos's parting shot was trying to expel a Democrat too. It's getting ugly in there. The tit for tat needs to stop or we'll all suffer. At least the ethics committee did its job. This sends a message that Congress is taking accountability seriously. Let's hope they keep it up. It's about time our institutions regain some credibility. This was a step in the right direction. We'll see if they can clean up their act. Well, that about wraps up our weekend edition. Any plans for the weekend, you guys? Well, I'm taking in the tour of Highclear Castle with the opportunity to explore the Egyptian exhibition in the castle cellars. No kidding. Sounds like fun. Well, the exhibition is in April, but I am reading up about it. Did they ever figure out who created polygonal masonry? You mean the multi-ton blocks that fit together so tightly that a credit card can't even fit into the spaces? Yeah, the technology we can't even recreate thousands of years later. No, there are lots of theories. I think it might be an advanced form of sapien puppetensis that traveled back in time. Let's explore that possibility in an upcoming BG episode. I'm in. Okay, I'm out of here. I'm meeting a fella at the park. A human fella? I'll never tell. She's getting another cat. Why? Are they cheaper by the dozen? Haha. <laughs> <laughs>